Um, the final speaker for this session is Dr. Jessica Watterson, and she is coming to us all the way from Indonesia, from Jakarta. She's a senior lecturer in digital health at Jeffrey Che School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Monash University, Malaysia campus, which also has a campus in Jakarta. Her research focuses on the design and evaluation of digital health technologies, particularly for underserved populations. Today, she'll be talking to us about the work she's doing in Asia through the Network for Equity through Digital Health, or NEED, one of the sponsors for this event. So thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Um, are you able to see my slideshow? Yep. Oh, yes. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about something that I'm very passionate about, which is applying co-design um, to improve digital health technologies and make sure that they're as equitable as, po as possible. Um, so the term co-design, I think, has been used uh, really widely and has lots of different applications. So I just included this sort of introduction uh, to say that I know there are lots of different ways that people use the term co-design. Sometimes it's led more by designers, sometimes more by researchers. Sometimes we're treating the, the end user of the technology more as a subject and sometimes more as a partner. Um, so just to sort of lay the groundwork, I wanted to say how I'm planning to use the term co-design today. And I really think about co-design as the collective creativity of designers, or in my case, researchers, um, and people who are not trained in design working together in the design development process. Um, so that's sort of how uh, I'm approaching this um, challenge. And I'm actually going to be talking a little bit today about some work that I did um, in the US, so not in Asia, um, just because I wanted to be able to present sort of the full process from the beginning of co-design all the way to when we actually had some results that I could share. Um, and then I'll also show you a little bit about how we're applying these co-design methods to some projects that are currently happening in Malaysia as well. So the case study I'll be talking about, we're calling free time for wellness. And the challenge that we were trying to address is that currently over 50% of Americans, and I would imagine that it's a similar statistic in Australia, um, are not currently meeting exercise recommendations. And this is particularly true among low income communities uh, where there are even lower rates of physical activity and higher rates of chronic disease. So this idea emerged out of a National Institute of Health um, sandpit workshop that I attended in the US. And one of our team members mentioned that she was at the, the event because she had some childcare taken care of at home from one of her neighbors. And she pointed out that they had met on a social media platform called Nextdoor and that her neighbor often would watch her kids for her while she would go and do exercise. And so that sparked an idea for us. Um, the idea that we came up with was whether we could use the Nextdoor platform, which is a social media platform that connects you to other people living in your same neighborhood um, and verifies your address to make sure that you actually live there. Could we use that platform to help low-income mothers connect with one another, build relationships, and organize some kind of routine physical activity? So that was kind of the idea that we came up with without ever consulting with the community as we were at a funding, uh, you know, we had to pitch our idea for funding. Uh, the community that we chose to focus on um, based on one of our collaborators' locations was uh, in Washington Heights in Manhattan. It's a predominantly low income and mostly Latinx community. And we had strong connections already to the community um, through the uh, Columbia University Community Center. So we started off by trying to understand the barriers and facilitators that this community was facing to, um, uh, to wellness or to being able to promote their own health. And we did that through qualitative interviews with 10 mothers living in the neighborhood. Um, they talked a lot about how they didn't have any free time for themselves. Um, they, when they had time, they were prioritizing their family's needs over their own. 
They also talked about how they received relatively little support from their partners with household duties and childcare. Most of the burden was, was falling on them. They also talked about how they felt that physical activity was important to them, but they just didn't have time for activities like going to the gym. Um, and, but they did describe some of the other activities that they were doing in their daily lives that, that were physically active, things like cleaning, carrying their children, um, living in an urban setting like New York City, or often carrying groceries, laundry down the street, those kinds of things. Um, and they also talked about how much they wanted a community center in their neighborhood. Um, they talked about how there used to be a community center and they, it, had, it was no longer there. And things like childcare and activities for mothers um, was something that they really valued. So our next step after the interviews was to run a co-design workshop. And for the workshop, we had 16 participants, some of the same participants from interviews and also some new participants. And the, through the co-design workshop, we explored what kinds of activities they were interested in, what kinds of ideas they had for creating more free time for themselves, for their own well-being, um, their sort of familiarity and comfort with technology and with the next door application. Um, and through this activity or through this um, workshop, we discovered that they were interested in activities like yoga, um, dance, fitness, and they also brought up a brand new idea that we hadn't thought about, um, which was to visit food pantries together as a group. So they talked about how due to food insecurity, they would uh, go make trips to food pantries to get food for their family. But there was a lot of stigma attached with that and also a lot of time waiting where they would often have to stand in lines. Um, and so the idea was that if you were going in a group that it could be a lower stigma and just more enjoyable. Um, participants also talked about how they had not used Nextdoor previously, and some of them were also unsure how to install a new app on their phone. Another key learning we had from the co-design workshop was that we provided professional childcare during the workshop in a, se in a separate room. And when we came into this, we were thinking that one potential um, intervention idea would be to have the mothers take turns uh, watching children in groups while another group went to do some kind of exercise. And when we talked to mothers about that idea, they were not comfortable with it. They liked the idea of having professional childcare like we provided for the workshop, but they didn't like the idea of having other mothers look after their kids. Um, the next uh, major learning, or sorry, the um, final co-designed intervention that we arrived at rotated between these activities that the mothers talked about, dance fitness classes, yoga, food pantry visits, and another idea they suggested was having group play dates where they could get together and play with their kids. Um, all of the fitness activities had professional childcare in an adjacent room based on that learning we have from the co-design workshop. And based on the, the fact that um, quite a few of the participants were not very comfortable with using a new app, we also um, gave the option of either using the Nextdoor application or using just regular SMS text messaging. And mothers could choose which, uh, which approach they preferred. Um, so next we ran a feasibility study. Um, we had 21 participants in the study and it was three months long. We, so, we had a self-administered baseline and follow-up survey, um, which was completed by all of the mothers, uh, both the baseline and follow-up. And it measured uh, self-reported physical activity, neighborhood level social cohesion. So trying to get at um, how unified they felt their neighborhood was. Um, the, their sense of community with the other mothers in the intervention um, and their quality of life and capability. And this study really wasn't powered to detect changes. We were mostly just trying to make sure that it was actually feasible to measure these types of things um, in the hopes of doing a larger scale study in the future. So most of our key learnings were really around the implementation and again, trying to uh, uh, learn for, for a future larger study. So one of our key learnings was that we wanted to um, employ people from the community who could be community champions uh, that were actually the ones sort of leading and facilitating these activities. 
Um, but we found that when we invited three different community members to uh, join as a community champion, they were put off by the ethics training and paper mint requ and paperwork requirements um, that were put forward by the university. So this is a real challenge for sort of real world community research because we we're, we're trying to balance the university's requirements with what was actually um, feasible for people living in the community. And unfortunately, in the end, we had to have two researchers um, from our team fulfill that sort of coordination and motivation role um, rather than members of the community. Um, another key learning was that the activities were uh, quite well attended. 90% of the participants attended at least one activity and a little over 50% attended three or more. There were 11 total activities over the course of the three months. Um, the play dates were actually the most popular, the more just sort of social get together. Um, and then dance and yoga were the next two most popular activities. Um, we also heard from mothers that 90% in both groups uh, felt comfortable with the platform they were using. So 90% of the people using Nextdoor felt comfortable, 90% using SMS felt comfortable. Um, however, there was a, a participant in each group that had a challenge with their platform. Um, someone within the next door group said that they felt like having to log into another app and actually, you know, do something else uh, was just one more thing to do on their on their list of things to do that day. So it was more of a burden than a help. Um, a participant in the SMS group talked about how they had a low cost mobile phone plan that actually didn't allow them to download some of the multimedia messages that were sent. So both technology applications had some challenges. Um, we also heard that mothers had a, found it difficult to attend the activities because their schedules were so busy. Um, we were only able to offer the activities on once a week and we chose the time that they said worked best for them, which was Saturday mornings. Uh, but they talked about how more frequent offerings would really be helpful given their busy schedules. Um, we also had to decrease our samples, our target sample size from 30 down to 21 um, because uh, New York City has limitations on the ratio of how many children um, can be looked after by a single child care. And so based on our numbers of child cares that we were able to get for the ac activities, we then had to um, decrease the number of participants. Um, but we did know from our co-design session that the child care, from the co-design session and from the um, post-intervention survey, that the child care was extremely important to the intervention. So that was definitely something that we couldn't adjust or get rid of. So tying this all back, I think that I hope my main point is that co-design is extremely important to the success of a digital health technology and to ensuring that it's equitable and includes uh, all the people that we're hoping to include. Our initial idea would likely have failed due to either childcare issues, um, digital literacy challenges, or even just a lack of interest in the activities had we not um, gone through this extensive co-design process. Um, and most of our final ideas actually came from the mothers themselves. So our next steps are, um, as I mentioned, the feasibility study was not powered or designed to measure effectiveness. So we're now seeking funding for a larger cluster randomized control trial, and we're hoping to actually test that role of that social cohesion that the mothers were building among themselves and of the providing childcare for the physical activity um, in hopefully promoting more physical activity among low-income mothers. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the rest of my research team here. Um, and now I'll jump into telling you a little bit about how we're applying this type of co-design work in our work in Malaysia um, as part of the Network for Equity Through Digital Health. Um, and the Network for Equity Through Digital Health is actually, we uh, span across um, Australia. Professor Chris Bain at Monash in Australia is our lead there. Um, I'm the Southeast Asia lead for, the, for NEED. Um, so I'll touch a little bit on some of our projects. Um, so one of the first projects is focused on seizure detection and prevention. Um, we are working on creating a device, a wearable device, that measures heart rate variability, predicts when a seizure is about to happen, and then ultimately delivers medication in the hopes that it could prevent that seizure from happening. 
Um, so we're still in the development phase. It's uh, we're creating a prototype, but the device itself needs to link to a mobile phone application where the algorithm is run and where uh, the person with epilepsy can actually see information about um, their seizures, their heart rate. And similarly, we want that information to also be transmitted to doctors. So the co-design co is essential in this project to making sure that the device and the app are actually usable and relevant for um, patients and doctors. And to, to accomplish that, we're working with um, people with epilepsy and doctors from a, a major public hospital in Malaysia. Um, this project is led by my colleague, Dr. Farooq Sheikh. Um, another example of a project that we're working on is um, aiming to co-design and test workplace wellness activities to promote better health among employees in a really diverse Malaysian workplace. Um, we're working with a company that uh, has positions from um, manufacturing, uh, obviously to more management style roles, and the challenges that people face in, in improving their health in those types of roles are really different. One is uh, you know, very physically active, um, but generally lower paid. The, on, on the other extreme, we have people who are probably higher income, uh, but are tend to be more sedentary and have jobs where they're sitting in front of a computer. So we're really trying to address a diversity of challenges of around workplace wellness. And for this, uh, act, for this project, we are conducting interviews first to identify barriers and facilitators to health at work, very similar to, to what we did in the other project I've shared. And then we're running co-design workshops to actually develop those um, wellness activities together with the employees. So again, very similar, trying to actually identify what people are, are interested in and what will work for their particular cultural setting, as well as the um, company's culture. Um, the other project I wanted to highlight is called Deaf and Touch Everywhere. And this project aims to facilitate remote on-demand sign language interpretation for deaf people who are accessing medical care. Um, so currently in Malaysia, there's no um, mandated uh, sign language interpretation services for deaf people who are attending care. So this application allows them to book on-demand sign language interpretation and to virtually have um, that person, uh, that interpreter call in during their appointment. Um, in this particular project, we have a really strong link with the deaf community in Malaysia and with sign language interpreters. And we've been um, using methods such as surveys, focus groups, simulations of using the app, and um, trying to in include the community throughout that entire design process. At the moment, we have a um, very strong prototype of the app, uh, but it hasn't actually been rolled out for public use yet. Um, and this project is led by my colleague, uh, Dr. Umadevi Palanasamy. So that's uh, just kind of a quick highlight of some of our work that's happening in Malaysia. And I hope in a, a future year of this event, if that happens, that we can share um, some actual outcomes. But um, I'd love to take any questions if we have time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica. That was fabulous. Uh, OK, I have lots of thoughts that I'm going to start with. And the first is, I, I found it really interesting that you talked about social cohesion and childcare as drivers of physical health. Is that something you expected when you went into that study? I think it was in the sense that we uh, had kind of come up with the idea from our own personal experience. As I mentioned, we that idea grew out of this workshop where I was working with other researchers. And in our own lives, we had seen how these kinds of mums groups or um, more socially cohesive groups had actually facilitated us to be physically active. And so that hypothesis kind of coming from our own personal experience was what led us to um, create this, this project. Great. And then wondering about the, you, you did it as a research project and to test the feasibility, and then you're gonna do an RCT. How do you see the feasibility of really implementing it and sustaining it in reality when it's not a research project anymore? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So we partnered for both the feasibility study and hopefully for the RCT. We've partnered with a New York City wide program that already exists called Shape Up NYC. Um, and it's a their public free fitness classes that are already taking place all over the city. Um, so the key factor that we're sort of adding in is this social aspect where it's actually coordinated through some kind of digital technology, whether that's SMS or next door. Um, and then also the childcare. Uh, so obviously the childcare aspect still would need um, ongoing funding and sustain to be sustainable beyond the end of our project. Um, we'd have some early ideas about how that could happen. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a really strong partnership with a community center um, with through Columbia University. And so we're hoping that maybe a, a, a body like that could take this forward after our research finishes. Um, but that's yet to be determined. It's a great example of how you need it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's the healthcare system, it's the community, it's, it's like this, so, so many different people need to be involved to affect these um, things that you're trying to change and improve. Yeah. Okay, I have a, another question, which is about the, the need and the different projects that you described in need. So there's so many different things that we could work on, so many needs <laughs> to address. How do you, do you have processes in your group um, how do you decide what to work on? Yeah, great question. Um, so this has really been led by the passion of different researchers in our group. So um, the epilepsy example that I gave, um, that's led by Dr. Farouk, who's a expert in neuroscience and is really passionate about epilepsy. So he's sort of driven that project. Um, similarly, uh, Dr. Uma Devi Planasami is really passionate about the deaf community after discovering that so many people were going to the doctor and having to, you know, write handwritten notes um, to try to communicate with the doctor. Uh, so I would say currently it's coming mostly out of the passion of individual researchers, um, but hopefully in the future we can also um, include the community more in identifying their priorities and their needs um, so it's not only driven by the academics <laughs> great and I, I love the use of technology that's already out there and just bringing it in um creatively so yeah excellent think... well, uh, okay. oh go ahead oh no i was just going to say i think that's really important as we learned from our co-design workshop uh, a lot of people aren't comfortable with having to have a whole new app on their phone or, um, you know, creating something brand new just for them. So we're really trying to use existing technologies when we can. Fabulous. All right, Mahima, would you like to pull yes. some questions from the audience? Sure. Um, so we have one question. Um, this is around the cluster randomized control trial, and this attendee is asking if the training will be done in English only, or will the build include other languages as well? Yeah, that's a great question. We've had, uh, this was one of the challenges we uncovered in the feasibility study, which I didn't mention. Um, so as I mentioned, the community is mostly Latinx. There's a lot of Spanish speaking um, people living in Washington Heights, but unfortunately our partner Shape Up NYC only offers classes in English and next door, the next door application is only available in English. So in the end, we chose to deliver our intervention in English only, but I think this is a major limitation and I'm hoping that for the RCT that we might be able to find other creative solutions. Wonderful. Um, we have another comment slash, slash question. Um, so they are saying public hospitals in Australia are very multicultural. Were the mothers of different cultures and was there commonality among the mother's needs across the different cultural backgrounds? Because this is one of the challenges of individualizing healthcare. Yeah, great question. Yes, so there, uh, the mothers were from different cultural backgrounds. And interestingly, one of the things that emerged during the co-design workshop was an interest in sharing across cultures. Um, I think it's on one of the post-its that was in the photo that I, I showed, but I, it'll take too long to pull it up. So I'll just tell you about it. But um, so the mothers, I, one of their ideas was to actually um, do yoga classes as one of the mothers was from, uh, from India and she felt very comfortable um, doing yoga and was talking to the other mothers about it. 
and some of the mothers who were from a Latinx background um, were excited about doing sort of Zumba style dance, um, dance fitness. And in the end, we did end up including both of those in our intervention. And those ideas came from mothers and their interest in sharing their cultures with each other. Wonderful. Um, and Gabriella has asked a question. She's asking, have you considered a process evaluation for this study as well? Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. So we did, um, we had some sort of process indicators, I would say, in our um, feasibility study, things like participation rates and, um, you know, just sort of those simpler, easier to measure um, process indicators. But I think for the um, RCT, we'll definitely need to be measuring those as well. And if you have any other suggestions of things that you think we should include in our um, as part of a process evaluation, I would love to hear it. We're still in the process of developing our proposal, so we can definitely use your feedback. Thank you. <laughs>